Welcome to online training, module two, lesson two, determining points of impact evaluation. Lesson two, evaluation hypothesis and impact evaluation indicators. Lesson outline. In this lesson, I will share with you expected outcomes, an overview of the lesson. Then we delve deep into the hypo hypothesis evaluation, indicators of impact evaluation, and then an attempt to look at managing impact evaluations. Expected outcomes. It is envisaged that at the end of this lesson, distinguished participants will be able to demonstrate understanding of the evaluation hypothesis, as well as appreciate impact evaluation indicators and how to construct them. Introduction. As we have already established that impact evaluation is a study of attribution of changes in the outcome to the intervention as it affects the targeted population. This means that impact evaluation usually entails either testing one or more interventions or evaluating changes resulting from interventions already implemented. Let it be noted that if all studies found that interventions that are under study seem to be effective, then any form of research would be unnecessary. So in this case, we see that any indicator is essentially asking whether the intervention that is being tested successfully improved frontline service delivery. This service delivery could be, for example, in the increase or in utilization of services or improved quality of services that have been delivered. Negative results can also be instructive. However, they would not be able to influence service delivery, except to discontinue an ineffective strategy. It is a common premise that any intervention that is designed presupposes the attainment of positive results. Therefore, in the event that an intervention culminates in negative results, definitely, that becomes a very sad development that can only give rise to discontinuation of that intervention. What is a hypothesis? I'm sure in our planning occupation,
we are very familiar or it has become our second nature to refer to hypothesis. What is our understanding of a hypothesis? What lies in the intervention testing is the underlying assumption of a prediction. And it is this prediction that is called a hypothesis. So evaluation hypothesis and the impact evaluation indicators will be the focus of this lesson. Let us look at evaluation hypothesis. A hypothesis is an assumption that is made on the basis of some evidence. This is the initial point of any investigation that translates the research questions into a prediction. I'm sure we have encountered a set of key research questions in some terms of reference. But rarely does it occur that that set of questions represents a prediction that is sought from that undertaking. The components of a hypothesis comprises a set of variables, it could be one, a population that is targeted, and then the relationship between the variables. A research hypothesis is a hypothesis that is used to test the relationship between two or more variables. What are the characteristics of a hypothesis? Being in agreement that a hypothesis is a prediction, therefore, it requires to be clear and precise for it to be considered to be reliable. If the hypothesis is a relational hypothesis, then it should be stating the relationship between the variables involved. A hypothesis must be specific and should have scope for conducting more tests in order to establish the evidence. The way of explanation of the hypothesis must be very simple and it should also be understood that the simplicity of the hypothesis is not related to its significance. The issue of significance as I area only emphasize as well that the statistical significance will be the focus of modules three and four. What are the sources of hypothesis? Where can we derive a prediction resemblance between the phenomenon under consideration, observations from past studies, present day experiences, as well as from competitors.
can give rise to predictions that will require further inquiry. Scientific theories are great candidates for testing hypotheses. General patterns that influence the thinking process of people can bring about the necessary drive to understand and generate new knowledge. What are the different forms or types of hypotheses? There are a number of them. Simple hypothesis, complex hypothesis, directional hypothesis, non-directional hypothesis, narrow hypothesis, associative and causal hypothesis. Let us look at each one of them. A simple hypothesis shows a relationship between one dependent variable and a single independent variable. For example, if you eat more vegetables, you will lose weight faster. Eating of more vegetables is an independent variable that influences losing of weight as a dependent variable. Complex hypothesis, on the other hand, shows the relationship between two or more dependent variables and the two or more independent variables. For example, eating more vegetables and fruits leads to weight loss, glowing skin, reduction of risk of many diseases such as heart disease, high blood pressure, and some cancers. Directional hypothesis shows how a researcher is intellectual and committed to a particular outcome. So in this one, we see the relationship between the variables as predicting its nature. For example, children aged four years eating proper food over a five year period are having higher IQ levels than children not having a proper meal. What is characteristic of directional hypothesis is that it shows the effect and direction of effect. Non-directional hypothesis. This one is used when there's no theory involved. And it entails a statement that a relationship exists between two variables without predicting the exact nature or direction of that relationship. Narrow hypothesis. I'm sure this one rings a bell to most of us and seems quite familiar. It provides a statement which is contrary to the hypothesis.
as it is, it is a negative statement and there's no relationship between variables. Narrow hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Most scientific hypotheses are proposed in the if-then format. If-then format. Does this sound familiar? Yes. When we're talking about the program theory and the program logic, we say the logic illustrates the theory in the if-then format. This is because it is easy to design an experiment to see whether or not a cause and effect relationship exists between the independent variable and the independent variable. Therefore, in the continuum of the narrow hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, we see that the hypothesis is written as a prediction of the outcome of the experiment. This one becomes important. So when the outcome is contrary to that prediction, then we are able to elaborate the board of evidence as envisaged from the onset of the experiment. Associative and causal hypothesis. Associative hypothesis occurs when there is a change in one variable resulting in a change in the other variable. What are the functions of a hypothesis? We say that the hypothesis serves several functions. It helps in making an observation and eventually the whole experiment possible because it becomes a different point within the experiment. It becomes the starting point for the investigation. We have a prediction. So this is the starting point. This is a reference point. The conduct of the experiment is having the prediction as the center of the locus. And it will help in verifying the observations that are being made around that center point. And it helps in directing inquiries in the right direction as things unfold. A hypothesis help in scientific method. How is this possible? It is because in science, researchers use hypotheses to put down their thoughts in the process directing how the experiment would take place. So their thoughts have been composed, teased out, and then linked along the experiment, how it needs to take place. In that quest, in that process of thought arranging, thought provoking, 
hypothesis becomes part of the scientific method because it is the prediction or explanation that is tested by the experiment under review. And it is the provisional idea whose merit, whose validity requires assessment. There are different steps that are undertaken in the scientific methods. I'm sure we're quite familiar with the scientific rigor. First and foremost, we have to identify the question. So formation of the research question is central to the experiment. And then we have to do background research over the question that we want to explore or inquire. And then we must derive a prediction of what research question is going to lead us to. We have to create the hypothesis. And then we need to go define how we're going to go about ascertaining and testing, assessing that prediction by designing the full refreshed experiment. And when the design is complete, we must gather data that will help us generate the evidence we need to test our question, to test the prediction that we've made. And then we have to analyze the results to concretize our evidence. Summarize the experiment and then disseminate. What does it entail to test the research hypothesis? From the preceding illustrations, it is obvious that a hypothesis is more than just a simple prediction. It needs to be anchored in a body of evidence, in a body of knowledge. As an assertion, as a conjecture, as a premise that is subject to verification via research or evaluation. A hypothesis becomes a candidate for scientific testing. It comes at the consequences of organizing our questions and the expected answers that grow out of them. Which eventually guide how the experiment unfolds. What are the criteria for evaluating a hypothesis? A hypothesis 
must be anchored in correspondence, whereby it uses a variable relevant source of testimony. So that's why we're talking about, you have to form your research question and then study the board of knowledge around the issue at heart. Hence the use of available relevant sources of testimony. The board of knowledge that exists is the testimony that speaks to the research question surrounding the prediction that we have. A hypothesis must be coherent. It should be logical, well-focused, and internally consistent within the existing board of knowledge. And it has have to have conceptual elegance. It has to have a minimum of abstract constructs and unstated assumptions. In other words, it needs not to be ambiguous. It must be very explicit. Let us briefly look at the impact evaluation indicators. As I said in the introductory part of this training, we acknowledge that we already underwent through a rigorous training in resource-based management, where M1E was very um, pronounced and the mod indicator was indicators were part of that. But we want to gross over uh, the issues of indicators just to position ourselves within the realm of impact evaluation. Let us reflect on this uh, poetic presentation from Christina Rosette, 1830. 1894, and I quote, who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I, but where the trees bow down their heads, the wind is passing. And the title for this one is, what indicators tell us about the wind? So if we want to know if wind is blowing, by looking at tree tops that are bowing, that becomes a good indicator. However, we must acknowledge that tree tops that they are bending may tell us many different things. It may be that timing of a change in seasons, it may be that it's a good day for children to fly kites, or that bed nests may fall down From these three aspects, it is apparent that what the wind tells us depends on who we are and what we want to know. So this is in tandem with a demonstration of progress towards the results, which only indicators 
can provide direction. Indicators are assigned posts that mirror the change along the path to development. Because they make it possible to showcase the results that are emanating from a development intervention. These indicators help in producing the results by providing a reference point, number one, for monitoring, for decision-making, for stakeholder consultations, and evaluation. Indicators are pivotal in that they can help to measure progress and achievements. They can also assist in clarifying consistency between activities, outputs, outcomes, and goals. They also help in ensuring legitimacy and accountability to all the stakeholders by objectively demonstrating the progress that is registered in the implementation of an intervention, but also in the process indicators can help to inherently assess project and staff performance. Remember the operational evaluation that I alluded to earlier on? It is concerned with the outputs and the inputs, which are the core of project and staff performance. By verifying the change that is occurring, indicators help us demonstrate progress when things go right, as well as provide early warning signals when things go awfully wrong. By identifying the appropriate changes that need to be made in the organization strategy and practice so that we stay the course. In this regard, we see that the continuous monitoring of indicators is very central in facilitating that we have an effective evaluation. because they are the key signposts into how the intervention or the program is unfolding. There are different types of indicators that are required to assess the progress towards the results. And these ones, are commonly referred to as results indicators. They could be situational or impact indicators, indicators at outcome level, and indicators at output level. Situational or impact indicators provide a broad picture of whether developmental changes that matter to the organizations or the MDS are actually occurring. These are essentially more or less the same, although the former may be more specific and the latter may be more generic. Outcome and output indicators 
Outcome indicator assesses progress against specified outcomes. And likewise, output indicators assess progress against specific operational activities. How do we construct impact evaluation indicators? Having hypotheses and intervention variables identified, it is very easy to construct indicators for testing these hypotheses. So if you review the criteria that were talked about for the hypothesis, the issue of clarity, the issue of simplistic, simplicity, all those are going to be easily linked with indicators for which information will need to be sought to evaluate the hypothesis, the prediction that we're making. An indicator represents concrete expression of target quality at a specific time and based on a concrete measurement scale. I think this is the premise that brings us to the fore of the whole question of the smart indicators. So three aspects must be established in order to construct an indicator. the quality to be measured, the way in which this quality will be measured, the scale with an upper or lower limit, its correct interpretation, the possible values that can be reached, the maximum and the minimum, as well as the qualitative significance that should be stated. Any comments and questions? Managing impact evaluations. We have looked at the hypothesis. We have looked at aspects of what kind of information we are looking at. We have looked at the questions that we feel can lead us to the appropriate data that should enable us to generate the required evidence. Now let's go through a glimpse of how we go about to implement the evaluation process. Generating a meaningful impact evaluation depends as much on getting the process right as on having a rigorous methodology. As planners within the ministries, departments, as well as government agencies, from time to time we are faced with various issues when it comes to managing evaluations, and more so for impact evaluations. Therefore, the whole aspect of managing impact evaluation entails certain ordered flow of steps in conceptualizing the evaluation process. We must thoroughly plan the impact evaluation. We must choose an appropriate design that is going to enable us reach the quality of evidence we want to generate and assess. Budgeting and managing 
the evaluation, an appropriate assessment of the resources required, interpreting impact evaluation findings, and then how do we disseminate the findings to the users. In terms of planning, the fundamental question becomes for which intervention do we perform the impact evaluation? As we already shared earlier on, that impact evaluations are time and resource intensive. Therefore, they have to be selectively implemented. And that definition of which one do we perform an impact evaluation against which one is a key question that we need to address. Impact evaluations only have value if the evidence that has been generated is used. If we can spend enormously on time with a large resource envelope and yet don't use the energy, the evidence that has been generated, then say total waste. So oriented towards generating evidence that can help to improve development programming becomes the premise of performing impact evaluation. It is anchored in generating evidence. Generating evidence in terms of proof of concept that can support continuing, replicating, or upscaling an intervention or more specific insights on how interventions can be made more effective so that development delivers what the population aspires. This cause, therefore, clear conceptualization that is needed of how impact evaluation of a particular intervention contributes to body of evidence already generated. In this regard, priorities of impact evaluations should always be based on the existing gaps between information needs of key audiences and the existing evidence so that we build a body of knowledge. Selecting an impact evaluation design. As I alluded to earlier on, that module three places its significance on the whole question of impact evaluation designs. So let's gloss over a um, few basics regarding impact evaluation design, leaving the exhaustive analysis to module three. When does impact evaluation design need to be prepared? At what stage do we need to answer how the impact evaluation is going to be implemented? Generally, impact measures years after an intervention is initiated. However, A study design is best carried out prior to field implementation of an intervention. Why is this important?
this is a crucial through a prospective impact evaluation design. These are designs that are nearly always stronger than those design prepared once an intervention has been implemented in the field. Why that so? Because the baseline data can be captured prior to the intervention having effects in the field. The baseline situation already starts giving the opportunity to ask certain questions, which can significantly contribute eventually into answering the questions of evidence that can attribute to the intervention on the effects that the target population award. It can even provide the possibility of random assignments being considered. Of significance is the fact that key stakeholders can be consulted on the issue as well as be convinced about the importance of undertaking evaluation questions early in the process. When we talked about motivation for impact evaluations, we did allude to the fact that we have internal as well as external drivers. Now, that, what that tells us is that we have a broad array of stakeholders in any evaluation, each one of them with their specific interests. And therefore, in designing the impact evaluation, We need to bear in mind those interests and therefore must be driving in seeking appropriate buy-in from the key stakeholders. So the design that we will have in undertaking the impact evaluation process must be one that will give credibility and the put at bay any fears that some other stakeholder may have in the evidence that we seek to generate. The baseline data allows us to check for balance, whether treatment or comparison groups have the same average characteristics as well as estimation of more robust impact assessments that are envisaged as a result of the intervention ultimately. How do we ensure the stakeholder buy-in? The wide range of stakeholders that are involved in the intervention, be it at policy or program level, must be included a very early on in the stages of planning for an impact evaluation. Stakeholder mapping becomes very central in order to identify who is who in the fray of things and what interest does each one of them have? And in responding to the area of interest vis-a-vis -vis the stakeholder themselves, that will guide us even defining how best we can lobby 
those interests so that we mirror our intervention in the evaluation process as an objective process that is going to add to the evidence and build knowledge. Within the implementing agency, there's their need to understand support and approach those involved in the program. The agency leadership is very crucial. We can't underrate the field stuff of the project. They are so key and instrumental. Their views, their perspectives must be well catered for. As we plan the impact evaluations. We must also work very hard to manage the politics. The staff of the responsible line ministry, including support at the highest level, must be engaged in order to minimize the risk of political interference that can ultimately undermine the integrity of the design. Any comments so far? Questions? Okay. Again, we have um, a set of questions, quiz questions in the module narrative. Let us grow, go, go through them and test our grasp of the issues that we have shared and discussed within the lesson two of module two. I thank you for your kind attention. Jerry Jeff Abaraka.